And if you follow along with me just for, you may be, you may be seated. If you're able to, to stay with me just for a few minutes this evening, I think we'll be able to get to, to the destination, I think, where, where God would like us to go with, with the word he's given tonight. Amen. Um, I promise I won't keep you here for a long time, but I hope it's, it's a good time. Praise, me, <laughs> Praise God. I'd, I'd like to talk with us just for a few moments, as you can see behind me, resolve to pray. And as Pastor mentioned, when the Lord gave me this word, it really stuck with me, and I felt resistance, and, and not resistance from the Lord, but just uh, overall resistance in the spirit of maybe this isn't the way to go. You know, I don't know how many of us at times have, have had a thought in our mind at some point, and we've questioned a decision that we've made or a choice that we've done, and you just, you weren't sure. But as I came closer and closer to this evening of coming to church, I believe the Lord told me, it's what I want. So this is the message I'm going to give to you this evening. And I'd like to start out by asking, how many of us make New Year's resolutions? Some of us might, some of us might not. Um, I tend to not be a big proponent of them because I don't personally think that they profit me. I'm not one that can take a resolution generally and say, I'm going to do it. I'm one of those people that by two or three weeks in or a month in, I'm off the bandwagon on whatever re resolution that is, whether it's to lose a few pounds or to grow more hair or whatever you, whatever you have. I typically have a, a hard time staying within it. So I don't put much stock into resolutions, but I think for some of us folks that, that do, I find that often people need to be in a place of desperation before they are willing to make a change. See, there has to be a recognition inside of them that what is going on in their lives, the circumstances of their lives, must not be allowed to continue. There must be a holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, complete, and a holy, H-O-L-Y, dissatisfaction with whatever that issue is, whether it's our health or our walk with the Lord or some other point of defect in our life, we all have to get to that point to where we say enough is enough. And I find that rarely in the lives of, at least from my standpoint, is a resolution continued to fruition. And I think that's, that's true for a lot of us this evening, and maybe not everybody in this room, but there are some of us in this room that when they resolve to do something, that initial motivation is often forgotten at the first sign of trouble or the first sign of progress. Sometimes we get a little where we get going a little bit and, and we think we got enough momentum to keep it going only to realize that maybe we don't. We need a little bit more. We need a little bit more of a, of a push. I think... Instead of resolutions, I think what we need more of in, in today's day and age, for lack of a better term, is a long car ride with Jesus. And I, I don't know about y'all, but when I was younger, in my early teens and, and pre-teens, I remember getting in the car and asking my dad, where are we going? He's like, we're just going to go for a drive, son. We would hop in the car and we would just go. Might be an hour, might be two hours, and we would just drive. Sometimes we would talk a lot. Sometimes we would talk very little, but it was a drive. It was time that I spent with my father. And that was a good time. That was a good time. I believe that in this 21st century world that we live in, the mediums of everything that we have going on today, whether it's podcasts or audio books, television, radio, whatever the medium may be, that we just don't know how to sit still any longer. 
See, we don't know how to sit comfortably in silence. I think our own presence and sometimes our lack of stimulation can be overwhelming to us. I don't know how many of us have tried to just turn off the lights and just sit there in the dark, quiet. And Some might call it meditating. Some might say, you know, closing my eyes or reading the inside of my eyelids. But that dark, quiet time, how many of us can say we honestly, purposely spend time with no technology on, nothing plugged in, and just sit in the silence? I don't know if a lot of us today's age do that. There might be some older folks that do. And, and sorry, Pastor, I do consider you older. You're looking right at me, bro. But, you know, I think there's a, there's a certain age limit or a certain age gap there. You, I think most folks today that are under the age of 30, or excuse me, 40 to 35, if you told them to unplug and unwind, they'd probably explode. Just because it's so ingrained into to who we are. I think that in that point of view that folks, we don't allow ourselves those gaps of silence because if we sit still for too long, we might have an unpleasant thought or reality bubble up within us. We might have that still small voice of God try to say something to us. And sometimes that can be scary. Or we might have the gray matter between our ears just going ready and, like I said, about ready to run off the rails and explode. So what do we do? We look for that next distraction again, that next light bulb to turn on or finger or fidget spinner or whatever we have. And so my question tonight for the church is, why is that? And what are we so afraid of? Why are we so hesitant to take quiet time, meaningful quiet time with the Lord. I think one place in scripture that seems useful here is uh, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 19. And from the dark of a prison cell left with little other than his thoughts, the apostle Paul pens these words, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Here we have an apostle sitting in prison, alone, with the only people around him as some unsightly characters. And yet he has the forethought in, in the quiet, in the solitude of that prison to say, for I know that through your prayers and the Spirit of the Lord... Christ will turn out for my deliverance. How rarely do we consider that our unsightly situations are setting us up to display the power of God in our lives? See, we like to hide all our ugly bits. We like to sweep things under the rug or, or turn the lights off when things get a little ugly. And I tell you that if you're a married individual or if you have family, your family's going to be the first one to point out those ugly bits to you. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, I don't think. I think sometimes it's good for us to have that check, to have someone to be able to, to check us a little bit when we, when we go a little bit away from where we should go. Amen? You see, we see the apostle void of any escape sitting in that prison cell. There's no... Spotify, there's no true crime podcast or audio books or YouTube or internet or little black and white TV sitting in the corner of his cell. There's no celly asking him to have, you know, whatever they do, sharing popcorn or whatever. I don't know, whatever snacks. I mean, I'm sure some of us could say, but there, it wasn't a time of top ramen. There you go. All right, top ramen, pop tarts. I don't know what it, but the point is, is he didn't have any of that, right? He, he was sitting in a place of, of isolation, and yet I find it fascinating that Paul does not resort to the escape hatch that we know as a pity party. Instead, in his moment of silence and his quietness, he affords himself a moment to reflect on what God is doing in his life. And, and I don't know about you tonight, folks, but to me, that, that would take an extremely abundant and powerful amount of faith to be able to do that. And so I ask us again this evening, when was the last time that we purposely placed ourselves in a position of silence 
to reflect on what the Lord is doing in our lives. When was the last time that we purposely unplugged, turned it all off, took a long drive for no other reason than to talk and to commune with God? We get so busy going from here to there, sports games and practices and and kids have events, and and, and those things are good. I'm not saying they're bad. But I'm saying when, when do we actually physically take the time to purposefully sit in a moment of silence, gather our thoughts, pray to the one entity in the whole entire universe that can actually answer and do something about our situation. Take the time to talk. Sometimes I wonder if we, if, if we don't do that because of our own insecurities between here and here. Some of us might think in, in, in the following ways. Why would God want to hear me? Or isn't God a little too busy for my little problem? Or I prayed so long for so-and-so or for such-and-such, and Lord, I just don't see it happening. But I think if we look back at Paul's language that we just read, that it slices right through these ideas. It tears them to shreds. But I think it's a little bit deeper than, than the thought of that. It's, it's that veil guarding the deeper assumptions of our heart. And sometimes I would dare say that we get that thought that rise up to say, well, maybe I don't matter that much, or it doesn't matter. How many of us have ever just thrown up our hands and said, I'm done, or it doesn't matter in any situation? I think we've all done that a time or two with something in any situation, just said, you know what, I'm done. But I wonder if a little bit of that is what we do with the Lord sometimes. We get impatient because the Lord didn't answer us. Or... We get impatient because maybe we're, we're asking amiss or it's not the right thing. Or at least in my personal experience in life, sometimes I've asked God, but I've been so busy looking for the answer that I didn't see that he already gave me the answer and it was right in front of me. I was too busy looking for the, what I thought the answer would be or what I thought the solution was. When in hindsight, going through all that whole situation, whether it be good or bad, I praise God for the ability to look back and say, no, that was the Lord moving in my life to have that. You know, hesitations, they, they come up in different ways, especially hesitations to prayer. But I would say that if we go back and we look at Paul's words, he calls us to action. One thing I love about the Apostle Paul with all of his writings, that if you look at it and truly break it down and, and study that, Paul's a man of action. Very rarely do we see Paul in his own writings and stories about him just sitting back doing nothing. He's, he's always praying for folks and moving and going to and fro. And I often wonder if it was attributed to, or I think it was attributed to that experience he had on that road to Damascus. And I don't know too many of us that have ever had it quite that experience where God just puts us down on our face in the dirt and we know without a doubt that that's the Lord. Because quite frankly, I don't know if all of us would be afforded the ability to handle that, whether it be physically, spiritually, or mentally. That would be a very tough thing for most of us in today's age to go through. But what I love about it is it gives me hope because I can see where Paul went through. I can read about Paul and I can say, well, you know what? If if that same Jesus that I serve today did that for Paul, then he can make me bold like that. Then he can help me strengthen my prayer life, not just for me and my family, but for others, for my neighbor, for the person I work with, or the person that's standing out on the street corner holding the sign, or whoever it may be. See, I think Paul's call to prayer is nothing other than a reminder that God intends for us to play an active role in building the kingdom of God. We were all designed to move forward the kingdom of God. The moment we were baptized and received the Holy Ghost, we're all qualified. None of us have a ticket in line that's higher or lower than the other person. We all got that same ticket. We all got that same golden ticket to 
the glory of Jesus. Amen. See, Paul identifies the prayers of the church as or God's ordained means of accomplishing his ordained ends. There's a means to an end for everything that God does, and he uses us to do it, church. He uses me to do it. He uses you to do it. He uses our children to do it. I can't tell you how many times in my life over the last 25 to 30 years that I've gotten a text or someone said, you know, I, I don't know why, Brother Joe, but I was praying for you. And I had no idea why they felt that way or how they knew to pray for me. But you see, God put something on someone's heart to pray for me, knowing that I was in a situation where I needed a covering. You know, as Pastor said, we might come in here on a Tuesday or Sunday and have everything going together, but there might be someone else in here that, and maybe they don't. And it's important for us to be able to pray and move the Spirit of God because that's the most important thing for us to do, I think, is to pray for each other. You see, we don't simply sit around. We're agents of change. We do so not by any act of our own presumption, of, of our own, I think I have something, I think I'm great and someone's not. No, but it's because God calls us to action. And I would say that the chief action that the Lord calls us to is the action of prayer. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 34 and 4. It says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears. I don't think there's any modern or postmodern or pre-modern translation of that scripture that could change what that says. It's pretty straightforward. I sought the Lord, and the Lord heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Church, do you want to stop the enemy dead in his tracks? Then pray. You want a deeper relationship with a family member or someone that you're close to that's gone astray or that's been separated from you? Then pray. You want a deeper move of God in your life? You want to flow deeper and further than you've been to this point? You think you have a calling or God has given you a calling and you want to move forward in that? Then pray. A few things that I think that we should pray for as a body and not just as a body, but when we have time alone, we should pray for our other brothers and sisters that are in horrible situations, whatever the situation would be. We need to take the time to be an intercessor. We need to take the time to step into that gap and pray for someone other than ourselves, other than our needs, other than what is in front of us. We ought to pray for the, the hearts of the little children that we have so that way that they would know how to grow in their love for Jesus. We sat here and watched these two little girls getting a hold of Jesus, and there's nothing, nothing that want to pull the heartstrings more than a child getting a hold of God, in my opinion. See, we ought to pray for the nations to be on bended knee because Jesus is coming soon. Why do we do that? We do that because he's called us to reach to all nations, not just our nation. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 is very clear that we ought to, be in that realm. We ought to go in, in all nations the gospel should move. We ought to pray for the sick to be healed. But I think more importantly, we ought to pray for those who are sick and won't be healed. That they might use the difficulty in their situation to draw near to God. See, we can pray for healing, church. We've all prayed for people to be healed and whether we like it or not, sometimes it's not in God's will for those people to be healed. And if that's the case, we ought not to throw up our hands and just say, oh, well, I prayed or get mad because we wanted that person to be healed, but God chose not to do that. We ought to pray that they ought to get a hold of Jesus and have a better relationship with Jesus through that situation. But not only for them, for everybody that sees them, for everybody that's in their sphere of influence. Church, we ought to pray for the lonely and the fatherness and the widows, for those that are abandoned and forgotten. We ought to pray for the presumptuous, those that 
think they have no need for Jesus because it's only through Jesus Christ that their heart is ever going to change. You can drag them in here. You can throw the Bible at them. You can quote scripture to them, but it's only through the power of God that they're going to change in their lives. But we ought to still pray for them. We ought to pray that they ought to soften their heart just a little bit, that they ought to come out of their situations or whatever is blinding them to the power of God be removed so they could be saved. Most importantly, I think we ought to pray for mercy. Because without mercy, we have nothing. And I would also say that we ought to pray for godly men and women of Camus and Washugal to spread the gospel to those who are around us. For faithful people doing Bible studies. For faithful people reaching out to the homeless and the lost. We got to pray for our pastor and his wife to be strong in what they need to be strong in. We got to pray for our children and their friends. Lastly, I think we ought to pray for a certain amount of peace in the world, not only at home, but abroad. I think that that's an important thing to have peace because I think the world is headed in a direction very quickly at a speed that in no other time in history has it ever headed that fast. I think for lack of a better term, church, the train is picking up speed towards its final destination. But I think as we look through the list of all the things that I just mentioned, I think we'll soon find out that we truly do have more things to pray for than we have time to pray. We could pray and pray and pray and pray. But is it meaningful prayer? Is it prayer with a purpose? You see, it ought not look just like a laundry list of or the grocery list of I got X, Y, and Z to get. It ought to be thoughtful, heartfelt bended knee type prayer see church prayer is the most basic element in our relationship with God and there's nothing complex about it there's nothing hard about it it simply requires a desire on the inner selves of who we are you want your family to grow in the Lord then do it pray and don't stop praying you want a meaningful change in your situations? Then pray. Pray fervently. Pray hard with desire. You see, it can be done at breakfast. It can be done at lunch or dinner, before bed, when you wake up, or any other time in between. All that matters, church, is that we take seriously our call as disciples to love the Lord and to pray without ceasing. It can't be of you know what, I'm going to run out the door with my hair on fire because I'm 30 minutes late for work. Lord, thank you for my day. Please keep me safe. Amen. Now, we've, we've all done something like that, and, and, and that's okay. I'm not, I'm not saying that we, we, we shouldn't at least get that little bit in, but what I'm saying is our prayer should be purposeful. Amen. And as I, as I get ready to come to a close this evening, I have the following prayer for the Church of Eastgate. And my prayer is that everyone here would see how especially special that they truly are in the sight of God. That every single person here has some role to play in all of this adventure that we call life. My prayer is that every single person here might know that we all bear the image of God and nothing that we can do can erase that or take it away. My prayer is that we all might know that we were created for more than food and drink and just to exist. We were made for the eternal weight and glory that God has bestowed upon us. You see, we were made for the joy of the Lord. Lastly, church, I would pray that this knowledge would lead us all to come to a better understanding of where we truly are at in our prayer lives and what our task for prayer truly is. I would pray that beginning with each one of us, that on our innermost being of who we are, the heart, that we would pray for our hearts, 
that our hearts would be protected, that our hearts would be able to be strong and not faint in this year to come and the years to come. I pray that Eastgate would have a fervency and a passion that never, never gets quenched. And as I, as I close this evening, I just want to say that I know we had a time for prayer for a few minutes before service started this evening. But I wonder, as Sister Tamara comes and, and plays whatever's on her heart to play, that if we would, whether it's at these altars or in our chairs, that we would search out in our heart a resolve to pray, to reach deeper and stronger in what the Lord has for us. Amen. God bless you this evening, church.